No, there we go. Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Meryl Kiriri. We are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe. And this is another live discussion with our coordinating team featuring subversive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. Hello, hello, and I've made exactly the same mistake as last time where I can hear my voice too much, so I just turned it off. There we go. Okay, <laughs> back to business. A few days ago, the UK decided to extradite Julian Assange, the co-founder of Wikileaks, to the US. Julian Assange, who's already spent three years in a high security prison in London, now faces potentially 175 year sentence in another high security jail in America, likely with prolonged solitary confinement. Confinement, But Julian has not been convicted of anything. What he did do was investigative journalism. He simply revealed what the US would rather have stayed hidden. Most prominently, evidence of war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, the NSA spying on world leaders, and abuse and torture at Guantanamo and other sites. And so the British Home Secretary's decision a few days ago opens the door now for journalists anywhere in the world to be extradited to the US for exposing information that Washington would rather keep secret. And at the same time, much of the world's media and a large chunk of leftist activists have ignored Assange's persecution or have even cheered it. These are people who you might think would be concerned with holding power to account. So tonight we're gonna to try and sift through all this and what it means and what, if anything, can still be done to help Julian and press freedom in general. So you out there, this is live on YouTube. If you've got anything you want to say, thoughts, reflections, rants, comments, concerns, please put them to us in the YouTube chat and we will put them to our panel. Let's kick off now with Julia Moore from the UK. Julia. Hi, good evening, Miran. Um, I hope the sound level's okay. Good evening, everybody who's watching. Yeah, uh, Assange, where we are. If we look at the broader picture, if I take people back to the uh, the constitutional crisis of Brexit and the politicians, the government, uh, pointing a finger at our Supreme Court and calling them the enemies of the people, if everybody remembers that headline. And so what we have in this timeline of investigative journalists and Assange being the extreme and, and contemporary version of uh, of this uh, relationship between the judiciary, the legal system, uh, and the uh, and government, and governments becoming increasingly more aggressive and uh, interfering uh, in the judiciary, and the uh, the current issue with Assange and the final uh, the final decision which extradites extradites him is in a long history of uh, the judiciary attempting to be the last bastion of independence. Uh, we have a, a long history in the UK of left-wing journalists who have been prosecuted, uh, the use of the Official Secrets Act being bent which way and ever uh, by successive governments in order to successfully bring about prosecutions. Um, I can remember, and some of my contemporaries can remember, uh, various uh, journalists being prosecuted over revelations of uh, satellite companies uh, in the past, left wing, small left wing journals like New Society magazine uh, were at the vanguard, a tiny, tiny periodical, but was very brave in the investigative journalism that used to take place uh, in uh, with that small team of investigators who were continually, continually harassed with the Official Secrets Act being used as the, the beating stick. So here we have Assange, uh, which is a representation of the power play between uh, the US and the UK and the, uh, the, the, the very thin line of our judiciary where its independence is being challenged on a daily basis, uh, being chewed away at despite some very, very tough and courageous uh, defences that are going on within the judiciary and the legal system. Um, and uh, I'm afraid to say that Assange is very much like Brexit. Assange is showing a light to the world about what happens when aggressive governments uh, start to become bigger than the rule of law that they themselves have set. And of course, for those of us who have been watching the dreadful party gate um, allegations over the last couple of months, we know that the rule break, the rule makers then become the rule breakers. And uh, our colleague and our courageous colleague Assange, of course, 
is but an extreme uh, victim of that particular process. So, uh, yes, one of our colleagues here asked a very good question that this, you know, has there been a tradition of this in the UK in English law? Oh, yes, is the answer uh, to that. Uh, courageous journalists. And in the week where we all mourn uh, two very brave activists, uh, who, one of whom was a journalist who lost, lost their lives in the um, uh, in the fight of, of environmental aggressive um, uh, uh, banditry, uh, it, we have to uh, mourn and support the brave work of journalists. And of course, Assange will be uh, the benchmark for which all others are are followed. So, um, yeah, it's as much to do with the interplay of the challenges to the legal system, which happens when you have a an extreme um, government who is now bigger than itself and is out of control. The British government was called a thuggish government in the week, and I think that's something that I'd like to probably finish on and uh, leave you with that thought. Thanks, Judy. Can I just ask you, I mean, since you're on the ground in the UK, what what do you think might explain the relative silence um, around this case in in the British press? I mean, I, I, The Guardian wrote something very, very short on it. There was one op-ed and a, and a rather quiet editorial. I mean, is it, where is the left? Where is the press on this critical issue? And, and why are they deprioritizing it? Well, Miran, I think we all know the answer to that. Really. If I may come back with a with a, a sort of an anecdote for the same reason that the Guardian, it's it's hardly bears imagining that 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 amazing journal uh, that started in the teeth of ac more accurate reporting for the Peterloo massacre uh, is now running articles telling people how to cope with austerity by wearing more than one jumper in the winter that's coming up. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound to me like a left wing press that's challenging a structure anymore. And the simple answer to your question, Miran, is that we have a concentration of right wing bias. We, we, we have, as you say, a few lines uh, of Assange. Um, you know, it's, it was almost relegated to the sports page. Um, you would have to look very hard, but that's because left, the left-wing press itself, there are no more New Society magazines, which was the little creature that dared to speak above everybody else. Um, you know, if you think that the, the, the biggest challenge to the mainstream press is probably Private Eye, which has a very different approach to challenging uh, main stories. But in terms of the mainstream press, you have to go online now. There are good left-wing progressive, as we know, online uh, platforms, but as you're talking about mainstream, the mainstream is right in the way that Australia's in the past, um, the mining companies bought up the two major press outlets in order that they could obviously protect the storyline on mining because mining and extraction is a very important of the Australian government. So back in the day, the Guardian was funded specifically to be the voice of investigative journalism as the left wing balance against that, which is an irony, as you were saying about how the Assange look where they look where it's come when there's hardly any not only coverage, but critical, challenging coverage. Thanks, Judy. And uh, someone notes here, Andreas, on the chat that the Guardian isn't left wing anymore. Um, Renata Avila, we've just been joined by Renata, our old colleague and someone who has worked on the Julian Assange case with Julian Assange and his team since 2008. Renata, can I ask you, like, if we've just opened our eyes to this now, you know, if I just landed, um, could you put us in the picture about what's yeah. going on now? Um, yeah, with Julian? Yes, uh, and I will do it like, you know, full disclaimer, this is not the official position of the legal team. This is my personal view as, as someone who has been like involved in this case since 2008 and who has been involved in similar cases and similar situations, situations of people uh, surrounding me who were like, you know, elevating their voice to expose the powerful. Uh, the way that I see it is, um, you know, like as there are in torture, many, many methods that try to kill someone like, you know, slowly. This is very similar, you know. Uh, the power of the ideas of Julian Assange, the ideas were so powerful, 
so rapidly out of control of the of the most powerful forces in this world, so difficult to tame, so difficult to stop, that the, the, the strategy basically that the powerful decide, and the powerful is not only governments, you know, it's, it's a complicity of sectors. You mentioned one, you mentioned the press, and we cannot disconnect the press from the private sector and from governments that dictate the news in many times. Is a lawful strategy. Lawful is using the law as a weapon to destroy someone. We have seen it in the case of Lula da Silva, for example, in Brazil. We have seen it through the years, you know, like before uh, in the 70s, you, you used to assassinate people. Now you kill people slowly by process. And you, so, you do it by, and I mean, I, I put it in context, you know, like uh, I remembered, you know, like Julian was dedicated devoting each and every minute of their time, of his time to um, advance truth and, and to revolution the way that news are uh, produced and distributed and shared with people in a, in a very dynamic way uh, which he called uh, scientific journalism you know like uh, show me the source analyze together what this information is exposing uh, uh, and then and then act on it that was his formula you know full documents full disclosure not treat people like children treat people like mature uh, individuals and collectives that could like you know like uh, understand like you know ev evolve the level of understanding of people like democratizing the power of journalism not in this like okay like let's film everybody like you know like idiots with phones everywhere but analyze what we have with your with, with the collection of knowledges we can make something better that was really threatening to journalism in, in itself you know like uh, because they had been like as the guardian name says you know the guardians of truth and this very disruptive method like you know he was dedicated all his technology knowledge collecting people from all over and so on the moment that the cases started against him, all his brain power, all his resources, all his networks were completely diverted into that. It's a little bit of what happens when, uh, when the, you know, a community leader or social leader is killed in a dramatic way. All the resources, all the causes, everything is like diverted into this effort of uh, find the truth of who killed who, right? And all the message and all the fights behind are like forgotten. This, but in the case of Julian, is fun, is, is the most sophisticated case of lawfare I have seen in my life. And it has deployed. I remember that uh, the WikiLeaks uh, task force was uh, uh, set up by Barack Obama against WikiLeaks and uh, against Julian. Had thousands, it was the unprecedented in nature because of the number of disciplines that were involved. And a number of people, there were thousands of people on the other side of the Atlantic dedicated to one, one man with a computer, one case, you know. And that's, it has been an investment in over a decade. I mean, like I would say a 14 years investment from the CIA, from you know, the Department of Justice, from the FBI and other agencies, from intelligence units from different other countries and so on to destroy one person. And it is not only like, you know, like, and even if they have tried and tried, the evidence of the case is so weak. The evidence of the case is so fragile they, that they decided to go for the bureaucratic, like Kafka, it's almost Kafka, you know, approach of delaying to the maximum a process that, I mean, delay, delaying the process, making it like, you know, like as irregular as possible placing uh, 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 in courts people favorable uh, uh, to, to prosecuting him and destroying him uh, with legal means, by legal means, applying all the exceptions possible. I mean, the, the right of asylum was ignored. I mean, no, 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 no big surprise now in the UK, you no, know, like because that, 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 that seems to be the standard these days, but in the past, you know, like if we think 20 years ago, you know, the right of asylum was something uh, on an embassy was recognized and saved millions of dissidents all over the world. And maybe millions is an exaggeration, but thousands of dissidents all over, all over the world. So Renata, what, could... where we are now, like yeah. if we bring it to now is someone who has been four years in pre-trial pre, pre detention, 
that my in my face six months more of pre-trial detention and in my face a sentence of 175 years in prison can i ask you something um because i mean this is also a question that's just come up on the chat in relation to the smearing of Julian Assange's character and something which has changed, uh, the, 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 well, let's say peeled away at a lot of his support on the left, which is where you think you would think a lot of people would be supporting him. Um, can you explain that and explain the, the, the yeah. legal cases? And, yeah. And yeah, yeah, like it's very simple, you know, and it was uh, and it was progressively done, you know, like it was very, 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 very clever because you, you only need to like, you know, to us today, 2022 is very natural, you know, you, you really only needed a uh, data analysis. And the data analysis just of the WikiLeaks account, you know, like in 2010, for example, the Facebook account will indicate that his biggest supporters were precisely, you know, like left wing, young to middle aged women. You know, like it, it was incredible. Like you know, like it was me included. You know, like uh, at that time when I when I started like volunteering the WikiLeaks, I had like 25, 26. We were very excited. We were like, you know, the transition kids that uh, had like were very clever with you know technologies back then, and interconnected. It was uh, it was Allah El Fata, for example, was uh, that generation. You know, like, and and obviously, if you have a feminist. If you have people who really care about feminist feminism and feminist values, you it's an old technique, you know, it's a super old technique. You 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 want to trigger and destroy the base of someone by making him as in, completely unacceptable to uh, his more his more loyal supporters. Luckily, together with feminism, we were um, embracing scientific journalism and the right to truth. So even if it, it had a very bad effect on many, many, many people, for, but for women like me, you know, like I, I understood that case and many people understood what was behind and the intentions behind that. And it is very interesting because up to this day, no feminist questions why they just, why there are like evidence produced by journalist Stefania Morizzi saying that there was collusion between the UK uh, prosecution service and the Swedish prosecution service to delay that case as much as possible. Right. If, this is a reference, just to say, this is a reference to the accusation of yes. rape, which Sweden has now dropped the investigation. And yeah, yeah it was, it, there were some allegations. They were like, you know, he was never charged. And, and that's the most important thing, you know, like, you know, and, and he was like, please interrogate me. I'm here one month. Interrogate me, interrogate me, interrogate me. I have to go on a trip, but interrogate me as soon as possible. And the prosecutor got sick and got delayed, and then it got delayed. Then he was like, Inter interrogate me by a video conference, come on. And I, we can see now after COVID, you know, like all the video conferences, all the trials were taking place on video conference. And they refused for years. They said, no, we need to go there. We need to go there because the secret intention was interrogate him, say like, okay, there's no charges and unseal the indictment, which was exactly, exactly what happened when Julian was uh, arrested at the UK embassy. That's, that's super interesting because journalists like James Ball from The Guardian and, and, and others were saying how oh, he's paranoid. There's no such thing. He's, he's hiding in the embassy uh, to avoid. Um, and all the time, the, the, those who claim, oh, fake news, blah, blah, blah all the time when they, they, they were saying he's hiding on the embassy to avoid rape charges. They didn't yeah. even bother to, to do you not know, to uh, fact check that there were no charges. Well, and that's certainly been very effective with the social justice left and Me Too and so on uh, in terms of peeling away a lot of support um, from the left, unfortunately. And something else I would like to ask you, something I, I often hear about you know, from leftist uh, friends of mine who I don't necessarily uh, agree with on everything, that uh, that Julian uh, that his work was somehow helping Trump like ah, the connection that's the other one. I that. mean, there, there, you, there was they needed to update. Could you burst that one for us? Yeah, they needed to update because you know after it was like uh, proven that uh, that we were in the in the right side of history and the the case the investigation in Sweden was closed. They needed to they needed something more. You know, like and the interesting thing is. Um, 
it, it was it was one of the most interesting things showing uh, the partiality of journalism, you know, like is um, on how little reporting about the revelations. If there were not revelations about Trump, you know, like there were revelations about the, the Democratic Party. But back then, you know, like uh, back then uh, it was the uh, the party with the largest number of endorsements from media, explicit endorsements from media, you know, and and with the with the largest amount of power, you know, they were like the the, the power the, the 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 party in power. So it is not it's only natural to think that the press would be very interesting of accountability of the government in power and allocating the blame on the terrible candidates that the Republican Party, like you know, deliver in that election to the journalists reporting on facts, reporting on factual evidence about something, regardless of its origins. You know, like one of the things is, is oh, but uh, that, that's, that's an, I mean, if, if today, for example, someone leaks all the content of uh, the Putin's cabinet, will be celebrated, you know, but it would yeah. not be celebrated if it's all the content of the, of the, of the Biden's, Biden's cabinet, of Zelensky cabinet. Yeah. And, and it is very interesting why there's a, there's a, it seems to be a choice by people not willing to know some truths. Well, let um, me, let me it, ask you. Is, that goes against journalism, in I, my opinion. I would like to ask you about that. I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to quote a, an article here from Matt Taibbi, um, who actually gets back to the source of what this was all about, the, the 2010 collateral murder video that yeah. um, WikiLeaks released. He says, in the 2010 collateral murder video, an Apache helicopter crew falsely claims to have encountered a firefight and lights up a Baghdad street, killing a dozen people, including two Reuters employees. But somehow even more disturbing than the killing is the dialogue captured between the pilots and the base. They're laughing in part, saying things like, just fucking get them, just open them up. All right, hit them. Hey, you shoot, I'll talk, etc." Now, I want to ask you something, Renata, and we've got you here. Like right now, we're seeing evidence of war crimes in, in the Ukraine war, um, and war crimes are back in, in the public consciousness. And yet these war crimes of the US are, that Julian exposed, are utterly forgotten about. And you see that whenever his name is mentioned, it's often mentioned in conjunction with all this other stuff that happened afterwards, and we forget the hey. actual original embarrassment to the U.S. Can you speak a little bit about that? And uh, why it, it, the public it, I, I, I mean, I mean, and, and again, it is, it, it is, uh, it is the interesting thing that you know. Um, so Julian started, like you know, like just um, uncovering and exposing events, like you know, like it was like the. Uh, uh, massacres in Kenya again and, and extrajudicial killings of students, for example, or corruption in Peru. I mean, all these leaks are not mentioned anymore. And he even won um, human rights awards because of that, you know, or banking corruption in Iceland. Then when, when more revelations came and, and we had more data, more documents and government documents to analyze what was going on in the world, the, his analysis got more interesting because his analysis was not of isolated facts. He started connecting the dots and that makes him like a very, very interesting person for anybody, you know, like he started connecting the dots, the arms industry, trade agreements, security uh, agreements, a, a technology that it is uh, designed to be uh, to spy on us and to um, and now we can see all the exploits with the, uh, years after Julian already warned us about it with the Pegasus case, for example. So, you know, like is, is, is uh, Julian as a journalist showed people the big picture of power. And of course, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he wasn't able to. He 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 exposed the big picture of Anglo power, basically, because it's his language and it's his culture. Like blaming him, blaming someone, for example. Oh, but you didn't expose anything about the Chinese and the Russians and blah. Julian is he has been like you know loyal to where he belongs and what he can understand the most. You cannot You cannot do journalism 
unless you spend a lot of time and you spend that and you create lots of networks you don't have to be like and that's difficult when you have to litigate law for cases against you so that that's that's something interesting you know like because they don't say the same uh, you know to uh, many other like you know journalists that only report about one single issue you know like why he had the obligation it seems in this this very perverse narrative that he had to report about each and every issue in the world to be fair he was just doing his job um, something else I want to ask you before I bring um, some other people in here because it's, it's been really interesting um the oh, you, we often hear a criticism leveled at WikiLeaks it, it was that the, the way that they put a lot of information out there as opposed to filtering etc cetera, etc cetera. um and this apparently in in certain circumstances i i i can't speak to which but in certain circumstances according to the, the narrative affected people negatively or exposed uh, people or confidential information you know, like about, I... in, about civilians rather than just the powerful can you explain? Yes, that? Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted like uh, it, it is very ironic because you know like uh, the 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 if we look at other uh, content industries like uh, the health and fashion industry, they publish on a daily basis tremendous amount of information that end up hurting people actually, you know, and destroying the health of many 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 people across the world, and nobody says a word about it. Anyway. That, that said, uh, that said, because why? Because it doesn't threaten power. It destroys the little people, you know. It destroys the the young people, the most vulnerable, basically. It exploits the it exploits, exploits the masses, not it, it, it instead of exposing the elite. So uh, to me, you know, like it's very interesting because uh, it wasn't proven. Like uh, Chelsea Manning, Manning trial. After, after she was subject to solitary confinement and after she was tortured, was a long, like, you know, like the same, the same, like huge investigation task force that they, that they deployed, they deployed in this, uh, for, for this case, they couldn't find a single history of harm, a single person that was harmed, except, you know, like yeah, the ego of so many people or the, deteriorated relationships between the powerful because they were like they, they discovered how I mean how what was going on really behind closed doors and how hypocrites they were to each other so so that 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 was to me like you know like uh, to me that, that uh, is evidence and people keep repair, repeating and claiming that showing unredacted information is bad for people actually I think that is the opposite. And I actually, I think that, you know, like uh, we can't trust, I, I can only trust uh, what I read from a journalist when I see the document that back that claim. Why should I trust the journalist if, I, uh, if the journalist is refusing me to show me all the data? And I think that if the information was so sensible, and that's a principle of any privacy lawyer, you know, it shouldn't have been collected in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And share with, well, if, then imagine, just, just for context for the people uh, unfamiliar with the databases that uh, Chelsea Manning allegedly leaked, um, they were accessible to millions of users. You cannot claim that it's highly sensitive information that the, you are putting the, the lives at risk if you are sharing it with millions. It's too many points of failure. It's insecure and it is negligent by design. The, the U.S. government should be sued, sued by those allegedly exposed sources, not Julian. Thank you for that, Renata. Okay, I, I would like to bring some other people in, but before I'm going to just uh, read a couple of comments from the chat. We've got Kat mentions that Netflix is now pushing three shows smearing Julian Assange. I, I can't verify it, but it wouldn't be surprising. Um, Yasemid asks, how likely is it that the UK would abide by a positive ruling down the line by the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights? Uh, perhaps we can return to that at the, at the end. And Celia wonders, how much time was wasted over the years by prosecutors trying to argue that Julian wasn't a journalist? Um, Beral Madra from Turkey, if I can bring you in, and Renata will return to you later. Go on, Beral. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Julian Assange's case is emblematic uh, uh, 
for the uh, period we are living in, post-truth. For post-truth, it's really emblematic. But um, let us, uh, through Assange's case, uh, we should also mention all the journalists who are in jail at this uh, period. I mean, over 200, uh, maybe 300 journalists are in jail all over the world. So uh, let us uh, remember uh, them too. And also the ones who were killed. Just I would like to remember uh, Shirin, uh, the Al Jazeera journalist who was killed in uh, in Palestine just a, a few weeks ago. So um, I think the whole history is full of these cases, especially 20th century history. And in Turkey, we have numerous examples of these uh, investigative uh, journalists in prison. At the moment, uh, Turkey is, um, according to the uh, reports, uh, Turkey is in the list uh, in sixth position and uh, China and uh, many other countries are in the first one, third one, etc. But uh, Turkey is the sixth uh, country. Now uh, there are maybe over 100 journalists are in, in jail and uh, very uh, similar to the case of Julian Assange is Osman Kavala and uh, also the, the seven other uh, persons who uh, talked and who really uh, criticized the political situation in Turkey. So I wonder, um, is there any other example in uh, United Kingdom uh, related to the case of Assange, or is it a unique uh, uh, case, uh, uh, Julia? I'm really curious about it. In, uh, were there other uh, important examples in 20th century, for example? So uh, is this a very familiar practice or not? Julia, please go on. Julia Moore from the UK. Thank you. Good question, Bilal. Um, without taking you through sort of our, our whole history of, of those people who've been brave enough to, to challenge, uh, for people who remember a history of the Falkland Islands, we had Clive Ponting, a civil servant who uh, um, decided to reveal some um, strategically sensitive things about how the government uh, took some decisions in the Falklands Island, how he was treated, uh, and he was certainly supported by a, a team of journalists at that time that's a, an interesting example to, to look at most of the cases uh, there are, are linked somehow back to the official secrets act which is what i was talking about earlier it's how the the, the government uh, usually bring about a prosecution that there's been a um, uh, somehow a breach in the official uh, secrets act and i think renata is the expert here that can tell us how the navigation went with uh, assange around whether or not the question here was whether or not he was a journalist and what he was doing uh, was as a journalist or as a as a, um, a proprietor of WikiLeaks and whether or not he had the responsibility of that. So there's a number of ways that governments have manoeuvred this question, uh, Biral, but it is, a, it, it is a very good one. And the answer is yes. I mean, journalists are, as a convention, journalists are protected by their editorial teams. I'm sure you know that there's a maxim that um, journalists don't reveal their sources and editors take responsibility for publishing as a general principle, but it just occasionally that, that uh, the government uh, break through that. And I just wanted to bring up this point and through the chair, Miran has, has allowed me to do this. And Beral, this is a link and something that Renata was just saying is that um, going back to Brexit, but, but the Assange case really brings it into focus. Um, the whole judicial system, especially the, the process of judicial review, which for those people who are not aware of it without giving a law lecture, is the system which is a cornerstone, which has always been seen as a cornerstone of democracy in English law, the way that the government can be held to account 
by its citizenry through agencies and through organisations where public sector decisions and constitutional decisions can be challenged by any member of the public acting as a class, acting as a group. Now, with the bitterness and the vitriol and the manipulation of Brexit, where judicial review was used to finally push for the process of voting to go through Parliament because the government was going to take an executive decision to trigger the final process for Brexit. The government have been out to challenge that and to roll back the judicial review process. And there's a bill being prepared for that to go through the process. And any government that feels under threat that it will not be held to account by its own population is the reason why DM25 exists. It's the absolute cornerstone of democratic deficit. And of course, the Assange case, we have a figurehead, sadly and tragically here, where for all the processes that Renato has gone through, all the, t the legal team have navigated all of the ridiculous ways that the technical process has been subverted, has been manipulated, and the rolling back of judicial review and the attempted uh, decimation of it is, is a, a very dangerous democratic um, process. And it's something that we should scrutinize uh, as, a, as a progressive organization globally. We need our colleagues in Progressive International to take a look at the process of dismantling the UK's judicial review because it is a dangerous, dangerous indication of an extreme government. And Assange, I'm afraid, is a part of that history at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for filling us in on that, Judy. And, and, and also the precedent that this sets and the, and the fear it must strike into the heart of anybody who's thinking about exposing um, crimes. How many stories have not been written? How much has, has power not been held to account as a result of this prolonged torture of, of one person that stood up to power? Um, it's unimaginable. Um, let me bring in Ivana Nenadovic, please, from Serbia. Ivana. Hi, hello. And um, this is a very valuable uh, spectrum of uh, overview, I think. And uh, especially comparing, uh, you know, what we hear these days quite often, uh, what Western values and uh, versus Russian non-democratic authoritarian dictatorship where journalists end up in prisons if they try to speak out the truth. And then you look at the other side of the mirror and, and you see uh, it's happening on a much greater scale uh, because it's happening for uh, 14 years in front of our eyes. And uh, today I really end up <laughs> asking myself, how is this possible? How is it possible that in the 21st century, with all of the knowledge, information, and sources, uh, we are still observing a prolonged murder of a person? Uh, of course, everything was mentioned. Of course, the uh, contribution of the media, who is which is owned by corporations and so on, and oligarchs. <laughs> And uh, then the um, private sector, the, the, the governments, and it goes down on the food chain uh, to, to the activists, to everyday person. And uh, <clears throat> Mehran, you mentioned that uh, a left uh, was either, or it still is, either silent or cheering this uh, prosecution, basically. Uh, for me, it's the same. If you're silent during all of this, you are cheering it, uh, whether you want it or not. Uh, but this is uh, the, the layer that adds on the basics. The truth was exposed. The government's crimes were exposed. It's most probable that this wasn't the only one and that uh, collateral murder video was one of... Uh, the, the, the war crimes that were committed in the name of Western democracy, in which we trust today versus Russian autocracy, right? So <clears throat> where left made a mistake and will fail every time, I think, 
is because there wasn't a distinction between two acts of one man. Uh, and if there was an allegation of uh, rape or whatever, it was an allegation. And in the legal system, you're not guilty until, until proven otherwise, right? However, everything was done here to cast this uh, smudge on Julian's name, which is a big one in the leftist circle circles. So as Renata already mentioned, uh, feminists were uh, repelled and most of the left either out of conviction or out of the fear that if you, you do support Assange, you will be also labeled as misog misogynist or uh, whatever. Add a layer of conspiracy theory, he's a Russian spy, which is a magic component <laughs> of every uh, dish. And there you have it. Why? And then the questions. Why did he expose everything that he exposed right after uh, ahead of the US election? He helped Trump and blah, blah, blah. So it all becomes a hot mess. And we are far away from the basics where we started, that he exposed he didn't steal it, he got those documents. Let's remember that as well. Uh, <clears throat> they were exposed and then a government, the holy government of the US uh, was uh, attacked. So they're doing everything in their power for the last 14 years to kill him slowly because they couldn't just drone him as uh, they suggested at one point. Thank you, Ivana, and, and of course, to set an example. Um, Johannes Fair from Germany, let me bring you in. Thanks, Madan, and thanks everyone for already so rightfully putting the case and all the facts on the table. I wanted to tell everyone a little bit about the reaction of the German government, which is like a very, they call themselves a progressive government. Um, it's a centrist, liberal, social democratic, green government. Um, and some examples here. The, the leader of the German liberals, our finance minister, he is repeatedly calling, rightfully so, for the release of Navalny from Russia, uh, from prison. He says nothing about Assange, nothing. The speaker of the German government, now that uh, um, Priti Patel in, in the UK took the decision um, last week, she was asked, and she's speaking for the head of the government, the Social Democratic Chancellor, Mr. Scholz. She says she cannot, she hasn't had time to look at this specific case and the decision now. And in general, she can say that there needs to be a balance between freedom of expression and freedom of the press against legitimate security interests of states. In this case, we know the legitimate interest is the keep secret war crimes, right? And they kind of put it on the same level as press freedom, which is just mind blowing, actually. Um, of course, they do it in a language where, you know, it's hard to, you, you know, it, it all sounds not so bad. Um, and then the third example is from the Greens, uh, Claudia Roth, who is actually our federal government commissioner for culture and the media. So someone who should be, you know, very much in favor of press freedom and a democratic uh, government. Um, she said that she will not comment on the decision in London when she was asked and that she expects a fair trial. That's all. And all of that is just, I think, probably an example of, I don't know, more um, details and um, quotes of other liberal centrist governments around Europe and ar around the West, but I guess it's, it's a very good example. And um, yeah, what can I say? I guess we have to just stop supporting hypocrites like that because I guess the rule of law, if we call for it, for Russian war crimes rightfully to be investigated and prosecuted, it's not worth anything if we, yeah, on the other end, don't follow up on it on our own doorstep. Thank you, Johannes. Um, 
a little comment here uh, from the chat from David Otnes. The U.S. is self-proclaimed self -proclaimed rules based international order directly contravenes the United Nations jurisdiction and laws voted for and agreed upon by the nations of the world. And there's a lot of uh, anger at the Guardian here. Shame on the Guardian for abandoning Julian, says one love after having used his journalism and sources for years. So if nothing else, maybe we've lost the Guardian a few subscribers for their, their terrible stance on, on all matters, Julian Assange. Um, let me bring in Juliana. Juliana Zita, also from Germany. Juliana. Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think with the German government, it's, you can see evidently that uh, I think before the election, many of, or, or a few green politicians said that they would support Assange. And once they came into government, they changed their opinion and it just shows where the boundaries start once they get in power, because it doesn't sound to me like they personally changed their opinion, but there is no other opinion for a German government that is an ally to, to the US, for example. And I think that has to do much more with this than uh, whether they find it right or wrong, um, because everyone pulled back. And it's obvious that if, if everyone pulls back once they're in power, um, one thing I wanted to touch on is on activism in Assange, because uh, thankfully there are many people and many organizations um, in many cities also, initiatives, who fight for Assange for years now. And I've been at many events and protests. And what I found very interesting on the street is that if people come up to you who are interested in figuring out who that is, what's happening there, the topic of Assange has become so complex although it starts with a really clear, evident, uh, you know, uh, case of what's the problem here, it, become, it became so complex that everyone has heard something about him. So one will ask you, yeah, is he not this guy who was persecuted in Sweden? And then you start there to clear it up. Or, you know, it's, it's just not, it's the topic itself, it's very, very difficult to transport to people. And I think when it comes to where, what we have reached as activists with Assange, I, I guess you could fairly say that we really failed to, to you know, transport the message of what is important here, here to everyone, to a mass of people. I mean, I say failed as in he's not free, uh, but I don't mean that we people have not done a good job, <laughs> to be clear. Um, but it's really difficult. And the problem is that you can see also that media is no ally to the people. So they don't see Assange as somebody on their side to protect. They see Assange as somebody who's far away, maybe even people believe even that he's some kind of part of the establishment. And I think that came at that moment where he got connected so strongly to Trump. I mean, he, he even here in Germany, people started to to ask questions around, but is he not involved with Trump, you know? And that makes him kind of a figure that is so far away from, from all of, of us. And that brings additional confusion into the topic and makes it even more difficult to get through to the people. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, for me, uh, a horrible moment now with this decision because it shows us that with every topic, there is a point where we can run out of time, really. So it's not just that we can act, you know, we can activist on every to topic forever. Everything has an expiration date when it comes to being successful or not. So, um, so yeah, it's not like I have the idea, but I, I think we have strongly to reevaluate um, also as movements, the strategy on how to, to go the next step and be even more uh, convincing when it comes to the topic in, in terms of, showing what the problem is and why standing up for Assange is standing up for yourself in the last consequence. Thank you, Juliana. And yes, I mean, you, you've, you've sketched very well a lot of the challenges there in terms of activism on, on Julian's case. Um, and it, it's kind of like Ivana said, the, the establishment has been very successful in sort of flooding the zone. Somebody put on the chat here, muddying the waters with plenty of negative information about Julian Assange, depending on your character, you'll be more receptive to certain 
certain narratives than others, but there's always going to be something there for you connected to Julian Assange, thanks to this, this very effective campaign against him, um, for, for people to want to distance themselves from it. Um, so I would like to sort of move away from that negative note and try to end on a positive one, especially as we're at the top of the hour. And Renata, I'd like to bring you back in to ask you, firstly, for your reaction to anything that you've heard here, uh, of course, in, in this chat, and we've covered many different angles of this very complex story. Um, but second, to ask you, what, what are the options at this point? The legal options for Julian, and also what can, as as somebody mentioned on the chat here, as a layperson, what can people do out there today um, to help Julian Assange? Aside from joining DM Twenty Five, uh, who obviously is a, is a friend of Julian, and I'll give you the details on how to do that uh, at the end of the show. Yes, being, yeah, being conscious of time, uh, the thing that I want to address is what the claim, these uh, claims in the official script on a fair trial. I was spied on, I'm a lawyer, and I was spied on while defending him. My computer was, you know, like stolen and given to the FBI computer containing, you know, legal documents. I was not the only one. All our communications intercepted. Evidence of all our meetings being recorded. Evidences of, you know, witnesses being bribed. How can we speak about a fair trial? That's the most important point. How can we speak of, of a fair trial when the lawyers were spied on? How can we speak of a fair trial where, when, you know, like uh, it, it is ob an obvious collusion between governments to destroy evidence and to delay process? We need to, like, you know, like, yeah, I think that that's something uh, that anybody, even if they don't know anything about the Assange case, can understand. All his defense was spied on. All his lawyers were, you know, like, spied on. He didn't have the, you know, like, the right to, uh, to, have, to prepare his defense in private. I think that that's a very strong point that anybody can understand that is easy and accessible. I think that an important thing is to avoid legal technicalities because uh, you will lo lo lose interest of people. Like basically what, what's going on next is a series of decisions that are falling into like, you know, British courts um, that, you know, like uh, consistently British courts have been like, you know, the lawyers, have, the, the uh, judges appointed have been like connected to very dark power and the rulings have been very weak and generally against Assange. What happens then is very, very, I think that all the appeals should be focused on bringing him somewhere safe, bring him, give him home, bringing him to, and, but for that, we don't need lawyers, actually. We need political will of a, an equally powerful actor, you know, like of a courageous state. And it can be the state of any of the states of, of what the, the membership is, of a courageous state, it, it has to be a diplomatic effort, but we know that diplomatic efforts are not activated if, they, if those do not pay back on political currency. So I think that the combination of activism demanding it strongly and pushing for political and diplomatic ways to bring this person who has suffered so much and to like make, make very strong like the claim that he will not receive a fair trial uh, I think that the combination of two is what can save him. And it's political, it's political as is our movement. It's not legal. It would not be a legal technicality in, in the end, you know, like even if it's resolved because of a legal technicality, it, it would not be the result of genius lawyers at all. It would be like the result of a combination of grassroots, uh, bottom up and top down uh, push. So to make it uh, to make it in our society is absolutely unacceptable to send him uh, to send him to a supermax prison in the U.S. Thank you, Renata. And if you would like to join DM Twenty Five, where we of course have actions uh, for Julian Assange and regular news pieces about the current state of the case and what can be done. Um, 
the address is dm25.org slash join. We've done a lot of talking here today, but we are a movement of action, we're a political movement, and we're interested in, in changing things and having an impact. Thank you to all of you We're at the top of the hour now, especially to Renata Avila, who joined us. Good to see you again. And to our panel here and to you out there on YouTube for your comments and questions. Thanks for watching and see you again at the same time, same place, two weeks from now. Take care, stay safe.